O'Neill Outside Radio is brought to you by these fine sponsors. Works Power and Garden Tools. Toyota, let's go places. Visit your local Toyota dealers today. Big Green Egg, the most popular and most versatile ceramic grill. Huff Shed, great storage sheds and custom buildings. Year One, classic car parts for American muscle cars. Arctic Ice, the most durable, versatile, and effective cooler packs available. Timbuktu Outdoors, the ideal solution to live bait. Furminator, the best food plot implement on earth. And the Georgia Department of Natural Resources and State Parks. From Black Powder Headquarters and the Bojangled Studio at Three Falls Cabin in the North Georgia Mountains, it's time for O'Neill Outside. For anything in the outdoors, this is your source. Listen in and call the show with your comments or questions. And now, here's O'Neill. Hey, O'Neill's not with you this morning. Scott Maxim, his substitute host of the day, is good morning and welcome to O'Neill Outside. And from Three Falls Cabin in the North Georgia Mountains and the Bojangles Studio, welcome to a brand new unused substitute host Saturday morning. Brought to you by Works Tools, Stripling's General Store, Tough Shed, Snellville Heating and Air, Rocco's Pub, the Georgia Department of Natural Resources and State Parks and Historic Sites, uh, Big Green Egg Smokers and Grills, nothing cooks your food better, trust me on that, True Turn Hooks and Roadrunner Lures, Arctic Ice Freezer Packs, going to come in handy for those summer months, O'Neill's Podcast, check those out wherever you get a podcast, Fisher's Choice Baits. General Spring and Ritter Critter, and we've got a big day of outdoor talk for you. I've got some stories about some kids catching some really big fish, and when I mean big, I mean really big. Getting outside is healthy. I'll tell you exactly why it's healthy, and it doesn't really matter if you're out hunting or fishing. No, no. This is just getting outside into the outdoors. We've got a lot of civil rest going on, uh, unrest going on out there. I've got some ideas about some gun purchases for perhaps sporting, perhaps home defense, perhaps both. We'll explore some options for you today here on O'Neill Outside. Plus, we're going to be taking some uh, calls, hopefully, from Captain Mack and Henry Cowan, telling you what the fishing is going to be looking like today. And I've got a report here on something that a friend of mine saw while he was out taking a hike. It's a snake, and it's a very interesting one. You're going to want to find out why it is my favorite snake and one that you should also like as well. We've got our Medal of Honor recipient as well. And throughout the day, your calls. Give us a call, 404-872-0750, 800-972-8255. If you're going outside today, tell us what you got in mind, what the plan is, who you're taking with you. Hope it's a kid. In the meantime, We'll be right back. You are listening to O'Neill Outside on 95.5 WSB, Atlanta's News and Talk. Welcome back to O'Neill Outside. Scott Maxim filling in for O'Neill this week. Darn happy to be with you here this morning and also darn happy to let everybody out there know that we've got a new member of the O'Neill Outside broadcast family. That's WSBM 1340 in Florence, Alabama. Welcome aboard. We are so glad to have you join us this morning. Now, being a new market, being a new uh, station, I'll explain a little bit about what O'Neill generally preaches about here on O'Neill Outside, and that's about getting kids outside, the next generation to appreciate the outdoors, whether they're hunting, they're fishing, they're hiking, kayaking, boating, whatever. It's about passing on just the appreciation of all that the outdoors has to offer. And so that being said, I have a few stories here this morning about families doing just that and some kids who made some very amazing fishing catches here over the last month or so. All right. Now we're going to start off out in Utah with 10-year-old Tyler Grimshaw who pulled in a 41-pound lake trout from Flaming Gorge National Recreation from a lake in there. Now, this wasn't a state record, but this was a big fish. And I wish I could show you the picture for this kid. He's holding this thing up. It's almost as big as he is. I mean, it's really a big fish. And uh, the now, he didn't quite hit the record with it, but uh, he's not far off about 10 pounds. The Utah State record right now for the largest trout is 51 pounds, 8 ounces, which is a monster. But Tyler's not complaining. As a matter of fact, he caught it by himself. 
He's proud of what he did. And here's the best part. He released it. It's just about the sport, y'all. No reason to throw it up on the wall if you're not feeling it. It's just about having some fun. Let's move on down to our next uh, young Fisher person here. This is a young lady of 16. Her name is Regan Werner, and she's from Minnesota. And on a recent family trip to Florida, this young lady hooked a 583-pound Goliath grouper (laughs) while on a fishing trip with her family. And she's from Farmington, Minnesota, and I can't even imagine this. Uh, She pulled in the largest grouper ever by a woman. It was a record that was held since 1961, and her Goliath grouper outweighed that, uh, the previous record by almost 200 pounds. So great job there for uh, young Regan Werner. And her whole thing was, what was really amazing about this was that this was the first fish that she caught in the day. Her very first haul was a world record fish that <laughs> measured 83 inches long, 75 inches in girth, and uh, and I'm sorry, the previous record was 366 pounds caught in 1965. The young lady weighs 115 pounds, so she had some fun bringing that grouper on board. Ah, but she didn't keep it. She got her picture taken with it, she got it weighed out, and then chucked it back into the ocean. Why? Because that Goliath grouper is a protected species, so bravo, good for you. That's respecting nature as well. All right, we got another one here. We've got a nine-year-old Tennessee fisherman by the name of Coy Price who caught an 80-pound sturgeon, and it's nearly as big as he is. So he reeled in this 80-pound sturgeon at Spencer Creek on Old Hickory Lake while on a fishing trip once again with his family, enjoying the great outdoors. And his whole motivation wasn't to pull in the biggest fish on the planet. He just wanted to pull in a fish bigger than, than his sister. So a little... Little family competitiveness never hurt, now did it? And uh, this particular sturgeon is one of the largest uh, sturgeon species in Tennessee, and uh, it's a bottom feeder and listed as endangered. So once again, Mr. Price released the fish and uh, got some nice photos with it as well. Uh, finally, this one is truly, truly amazing. We have a 13-year-old fisherman who, off the coast of Texas in the Gulf, while fishing with his father on a three-day deep-sea trip, caught an 844-pound tiger shark. That's right, 844-pound tiger shark. This kid's 13 years old. His name is Micah Harless, and he's from Weatherford, Texas. Now, (laughs) he caught this shark off the shore of Port Aransas. Um, He fought this shark for five hours uh, aboard this chartered fishing boat, And uh, he and his father now have an amazing memory. Now, unlike the others, he wasn't required to chuck that shark back into the water. No, you could keep it. So what did he do with it? He ended up getting it weighed out, getting some pictures taken with it, and then he and his father donated the meat to uh, a local charity. So bravo, good for them. And so what the whole, uh, what do we have here in common with all these kids? One, a love for the outdoors. You just go out and enjoy yourself with your family. Make some memories. You never know what's going to happen. But here's another thing. Not a single one of these kids set out to snag any of these giant fish. You know, luck of the draw, if you will. But the bottom line is, is the surprise comes at the end of the line once you get it up. You never know what you're going to get. And O'Neill often says that if you're going to introduce a child to the outdoors, fishing is a much better way to do it than deer hunting. Why? Because it's a little more exciting when the fish hits. There's a little bit more to do if the kid gets bored. Sitting in a deer stand all day long, uh, not exactly the greatest thing in the world for a young child with, let's just say, perhaps a short attention span. But the fishing, getting out there with the family, you can just kick back on the boat and enjoy the sunshine a little bit, throw the line over the edge, see what comes on up, and uh, have yourself a great time with your family and here's the most important thing about that as well none of these kids none of these kids will ever get the same experience playing a video game or anything virtual reality or anything of that nature it's it's real in the outdoors and so for that 
applause to the family for taking the kids outside. 404 872 750 800 972 8255. That's the number that will get you in touch with me, and we can start talking about what you have planned for the weekend. Now, that being said, your plans should include the outdoors this weekend, and I'm going to start off here a little bit by telling you why you need to get outdoors. First of all, and foremost, we're going to talk about the health benefits. And right at the top of the list, spending time outdoors boosts immunity. Oh, doesn't that sound like something we want to deal with right now in the middle of a COVID panic? Don't we want to go outside and see if we can get a little healthier? And and here's the reason why. This is the most, it, it seems so intuitive. It's because when you get outside, you're relaxed. It helps your body recover. You can breathe a little easier, quite literally. Plus, here's something I didn't know until I started uh, delving a little bit into this. If you get out into the forest, it's especially beneficial because plants produce, and I'm, uh, excuse me if I wreck this word, phytoncides. It's P-H-Y-T-O-N-C-I-D-E-S, phytoncides, which increase our white blood cells and aid in the infection, uh, uh, aid in fighting infections and also helps with our T cells which aid in fighting infection. Exposure to the sun will elevate vitamin D levels. And why do we want this? Because 40% of us here in America are vitamin D deficient. This can lead to depression, cancer, osteoporosis, and other problems like that. Uh, In addition, getting exposure to the sun around midday when the UV B rays are at their peak is optimal. Now, how much time do you have to spend outside? Eh, about, a, about two hours a week broken up, but this is the primary reason why, because this is the easiest way, the best way, the most efficient way for your body to get vitamin D. So there you go. 404 872 We'll continue with this here in just a little bit. In the meantime, I want to direct you to the O'Neill Outside Facebook page. Drop on in, say hi. O'Neill's always got some nice posts there for you to check out. And um, excuse me. In addition, hit O'NeillOutside.com. You can find out what the latest is with O'Neill, what's going on, what he's doing, where he might be appearing. He's got a, uh, a nice little guest book for you to sign up in there. And you can find out about all kinds of really great products that will help you enjoy the outdoors a lot more. My name is Scott Maxim. I'm filling in for O'Neill this morning. You're listening to O'Neill Outside on 95.5 WSB, Atlanta's News and Talk. Welcome back to O'Neill Outside. Scott Maxson filling in for O'Neill. We are coming to you live on 95.5 FM WSB in Atlanta and coast to coast on SB Nation Radio. If you feel like giving us a call, the number here is 404-872-0750 or 800-972-8255. And owing to the fact that uh, we're coming off of Father's Day, Hey, how about a few of your fathers give us a call? Tell us what you did with the kids over the uh, holiday, if anything. And uh, if you've got a few memories you'd like to share, I would love to hear them. But let's get back to the benefits of getting outdoors, okay? We learned, first of all, that spending time outdoors boosts immunity, especially in forests. Now, that threw me for a loop. Uh, Exposure to the sun will elevate your vitamin D levels. What else? Well, being outdoors can lower your blood pressure. That's right. It is the antithesis to the work week, everybody. If you've been beat down by the boss man all week, it is time to get out in the woods, smell that fresh air, get that breeze going, and reduce that stress. Now, how does that happen? The nitric oxide in skin responds to sunshine and widens the blood vessels in your in your epidermis, I guess, and it results in lower blood pressure. Who knew? All right, number four. Being outdoors reduces inflammation. And what does that mean? It's been in linked to a host of problems that include autoimmune disorder, depressions, and cancers. And the benefits of getting outdoors can be had for every age. So it just helps reduce any kind of stress on the body. Okay, Being outdoors is good for eyesight, especially for the kids. The more time and the earlier one gets outdoors in their life, the less chance they have of developing myopia or nearsightedness. Why? 
because you're working your eyes. You're not jammed up against the screen all day, 12 inches away. You're actually focusing on distant objects, close objects. It gives your eyes a workout. And plus, let's be honest, there's a lot of really neat stuff to look at while you're out in the woods. No question about it. All right, number six, being outdoors leads to better sleep. If you've been having problems waking up, insomnia, restless sleep, this will definitely help. Being outside, just feeling the, the, the air on you, uh, moving around the exercise, uh, it helps reduce just the stress overall, but also helps regulate body temperature. Hmm. And keeps the sleep-wake cycle, also known as the circadian, uh, circadian rhythm, in sync. So you get a more regular night's sleep. And for me personally, if I can get six hours a night, I'm lucky. If this can help me get more, I'm on it. And the largest benefit are for those uh, men who are 65 and older. So ain't there yet, but I'm betting I will be someday. Number seven, another obvious benefit of being outdoors is that you're going to burn some calories. And it doesn't really matter what you're doing. It doesn't matter if you're just out walking around, if you're hitting a trail, if you're out in a boat throwing a line over the side. All of these things are, are anaerobic exercises, and you will always burn more calories being outdoors than you will indoors. Uh, the high, higher level of activity is obvious the reason. But secondly, uh, as you get outside and you move around, the body has to work a little harder to process the CO2 levels and the oxygen levels in your bloodstream, which results in a higher calorie burn. So another benefit, you can drop a little weight. And here's a really interesting part of getting outdoors. When you get outside to work out, if you will, um, as you're walking around, the varying terrain that you may find yourself on is going to force your body to adapt and adjust to a lot of different positions. In other words, you're going to be using muscles to move around these rocks or up and down these hills and trails in ways that you don't normally do, and you're doing so non-repetitively. Now, why is it being a, a benefit of being non-repetitive? Because it's muscle confusion. It's a technique of building body mass where you don't keep doing the same thing over and over, otherwise your body adapts. You do different things in your workout. This goes a long way to helping you get a nice aerobic workout, but not doing the same thing over and over. The exact opposite of a treadmill, let's say. So it's highly recommended to do it. I've been doing it the last couple of weeks. I've been hitting the Kennesaw Mountain Trail, and I got to tell you, it's been a workout, and it's been fun, and I've been really enjoying that. So I will be doing that again this week. And when you do an, uh, an outdoor workout, if you will, when you're out burning calories, it tends to be more enjoyable than the indoor workout. How many times have we been indoors where somebody's music is over here and we don't like what we're hearing in the gym or there's something on television uh, or distractions? None of that is present in the outdoors. You can get out and concentrate on the world around you and just have a great time. I'll tell you what, we're going to take a break here for just a minute with this uh, list. I've got a phone call here with a question on birds. And if I'm seeing this, is this Sutton? Hello? Yes, sir. How you doing this morning? I'm Scott? doing well. I'm doing Hello. well. Uh, I'm not sure if I can help you out here with the bird question, but throw it at me. Maybe I got something for you. What can we do for you here on O'Neill Outside? Okay. Well, I was, you know where Lake Juliet is down there in middle Georgia. I was down there fishing last, uh, early last Monday morning mm -hmm. on the north end of the lake. I say north end. But anyhow, it looks like a hawk was, you know, flying. And I got to looking and it started diving in the water probably 100 yards out from where I was. Uh huh. And I kind of, uh, I guess it's an osprey. Are they native to Georgia? Do they put them there? I kind of looked on the internet and didn't I, find out anything. Yes, they but are. I, couldn't as tell. Fact. I said I couldn't tell if he caught anything or she. I mean, but they dove down from about I don't know, 75 foot about 10 times and went on and flew off. That sounds it was like cool an osprey. Watch. Yeah, it's, um, can, you t can you describe the plumage? Was it uh, like a real dark brown or did you see some like flecks of white in there? I could see white. I, I could say it was probably 100, 150 yards off. I was fishing off the bank. Then I, I would really say tell. I would say that what but, you probably uh, saw was an osprey, and I do know that those are native to Georgia. I remember um, as a child I used to go to this Chattahoochee Nature Center here uh, just north of Atlanta, and one of the raptors that they discussed being native to the Georgia area is, in fact, the osprey. 
um, and it, otherwise known as the fish hawk. So, yes, probably what you saw was an osprey. Okay, well, that's what I thought, but that was a pretty cool sight to see. Oh. And on Father's Day last week, me and my daughter and uh, her husband went on a hike down at the Dawson Trails in Jackson. The people don't know about it. It's a private uh, owned property with like 15 miles for the trails and things. It's wow. a cool place to go. You can go bicycle, hiking, or whatever you want to do. You know, and let me, I'll tell you something, too. Uh, over these last two weeks that I've been hunting the Kennesaw Mountain Trail, one thing I've noticed is that people genuinely look to be a heck of a lot happier to be out there than stuck at home in some quarantine or locked away, you know, afraid of what's going on. Well, that's exactly right. I'm lucky enough that I kind of live out in the rural area and got a little property, and I couldn't stand to be in Atlanta anymore like I used to go every day. I'm 56 now, but uh, I, I like being down and out. Every day I find something to do, whether it's hike, fish, whatever. Oh, and, and, and it's, people, like it's you say, quiet. they get outside, get them a little vitamin D, and they'll be doing good. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. We got any plans today to get out at all? I'm going to take my little dog hiking, I think. It's getting kind of stir-crazy my wife. She went on vacation with her friends. So oh, okay. That sounds like a plan but, as well. Uh, but tell O'Neill, I don't know where he's at, but uh, I got his prize package I won about three weeks ago. It finally came in the mail. There was some great stuff in it. Oh, outstanding, outstanding. What'd you get? Let us know. It's got, you know, the Fisher's Choice stuff, hat, uh, Swaggerty Sausage, uh, Coupon, Bojangles, uh, gift certificate, which I give it to my wife to go to Myrtle Beach. And then odds and ends, it was pretty cool, though. Outstanding. I guess it's his daughter, Allison. She, she, I guess it got hung up in the mail or something, but they uh, text O'Neill. He got it right to me in three days. Well, I will say this now. there, it, it, You do have to have a little patience, I would ask, if you do win a prize pack these days because we are still dealing with a logistics issue, if you will, when it comes to supply chains and you know products like that. And it's across the board when it comes to the hunting and fishing stuff. So if it takes a little longer, it's just because we're just trying to round things up. And, uh, you know, COVID, what can I tell you? <laughs> Yeah, I know. It's a terrible thing. But yeah. We're going to make it through it. But I appreciate it, Mr. Scott. You have a great weekend now. I will do that. And thank you very much for your call. Give us a call again in the future, why don't you? All righty. See you later. Will do. Have a great one. All right. 404-872-0750. That's the number you can call to talk to me. Heck, talking about uh, Ospreys is awesome. I love raptors. They are, uh, there's something to behold when you see one in the wild. I if I may digress for just a moment, I remember one time, and these these now, this isn't Atlanta, mind you. This isn't out in the woods or anything like that. But I remember one time I was standing in a parking lot in downtown Atlanta, and I saw this flurry of activity above my head. And I'm like, what in the world is going on up there? And I look up, and there are three falcons fighting over one of them having a snake in his talons in midair. And I had never seen anything like this. And that bird that had that snake in his talons was not going to let it go. And I mean, he flipped upside down. He would smack him. He flew down on the ground, covered that snake, and he defended it. And it was, it was an awesome sight to behold. And when it was all said and done, uh, Bird was left with his meal, and he sat down and had it. And it was, uh, i got to say, probably a pretty enjoyable meal for that hawk, if I do say so myself. 404-872-0750 is the number. Pick up the phone, punch those digits in that order, and you can chat with yours truly, Scott Maxim, filling in today for O'Neill on O'Neill Outside. I'm going to give you one more little thing here about the benefits of being outdoors. It's kind of a good one before we go to break. It increases happiness. That's right. Getting outside increases your happiness. It's a be- it leaves you in a better emotional state. It leaves, and it's better than being in outdoors and urban areas. Why? Because nature does a better job of making you forget what's driving you crazy than being outdoors in an urban area. If you can do it, do it. If you're in an urban area, do what you can. You're listening to O'Neill Outside on 95.5 WSB, Atlanta's News and Talk, and Coast to Coast on SB Nation. Welcome back to O'Neill Outside. The number here to call is 404-872-0750 or 800-972-8255. Tell me what you got planned for this weekend. Tell me what you did last weekend. And tell me if you've seen anything interesting on the outdoors. I got a couple callers here who I want to get uh, on the air. I got John here in Lilburn. Is he talking about the Atlanta Falcons or are you just talking no, about no. Falcons in general, my friend? Yeah, I think I confused your 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 screen. Your, no, not not the Atlanta Falcons, but your your, <laughs> your uh, Peregrine Falcons. 
Oh, yes, absolutely. The birds, the falcons, the flying falcons. Uh, I used to work downtown, and they had nesting nesting pairs downtown uh, in the high in the high towers. And uh, we were sitting. I was on the seventeenth floor of the building, and I watched the pigeon fly by, and had a, a pigeon. Uh, I mean, a falcon attacked that pigeon at seventeen stories up. Oh yeah. He, he exploded into a tuft of feathers. Oh, I don't incredible. doubt it. I don't doubt we it. Got to it we got to see it eyeball to eyeball. It was really incredible. I, I mean, had I mean, a very similar experience one time uh, here in Atlanta as well, John. I was uh, I was actually down in Shambly, Georgia, and I was just chilling out underneath a random magnolia tree on a uh, um, on an office campus. And yeah. I kid you not, six feet in front of me, right at eye level, I saw this gray blur flew, fly by, and then boom, just like you said, a red tail hawk nailed this, this pigeon yeah. right at my eye level, and it just burst into this cloud of feathers. Yeah. But uh, what was really uh, funny is that that hawk landed on that pigeon, was covered it up, and it was looking at me, and as soon as it saw me, it flew up and uh, sat up on a corner of a building and started screeching at me, and this little bird that it hit ran into a bus stop cover shelter and hit out there for about 45 minutes until it finally took <laughs> off. I could yeah, not bird. believe it. Yeah, absolutely. He said, I'm done with this. Yeah. But the good news was is that bird actually did survive. After I got yelled at for a while by the red tail, I went in there and got the, uh, the little dove out, and uh, it had a couple little scratches on its back, and... No major oh. punctures and some, you know, the feathers. A couple were missing in the tail, but I just let it fly and it just took right off. So it, no worse for wear Wait. on that guy. Yeah, a lesson learned. <laughs> it hit the right. hard well, way. <laughs> yeah. What would you do with O'Neill this weekend? I'm sorry. He's taking. A- What's O'Neill this weekend? You take the weekend off? Yes, O'Neill is uh, taking the weekend off. Happy to say he's that gone. his granddaughter is getting married, so he's out there My enjoying daughter. some uh, great family time. Enjoy that. That's great. Well, good for him. Absolutely. We're very happy Absolutely. for him. We're very happy for his granddaughter. And uh, for the first time in, in, in my substituting career, I'm not substituting for O'Neill as he goes out and stalks Johnny Mathis someplace with Gail. <laughs> there you go. There we go. All right. Well, it was good talking to you. You as well, it. John. Thanks for the call and call Thank back you. again sometime. Will do. Thank you. Have a great day. Let's go to another John. This John is north of the Mason-Dixon calling us from New York. And you have some benefits of being outdoors there as well, John, do you? Yes, yes. Greetings from the Catskill Mountains. Um, I guess I've been forest bathing all my life, uh, most of my life. And you're asking yourself, what's forest bathing? And uh, I saw a headline. I had to read about it. You know, I saw, what's this forest bathing? It's a term that people go out in the woods to relieve blood pressure, uh, stress, and such things, all the benefits that you listed already. And I guess it was established or started in the early 80s in Japan, and it's went on around the world like that. But um, some doctors are even prescribing uh, people to go out and forest bathe, to go out in the woods, basically, to yeah. relieve stress. And, yeah. No, I don't. It, I don't it, doubt that uh, for a moment. And and actually, as you know, getting back to what we talked about a little earlier with this, the uh, that whole thing about being in the forest with the, I'm going to wreck this word again, the phyto, phytoncides, <laughs> increasing your blood cells, uh, infection fighting T cells. I never even knew that that was something that was associated with being out in the woods. That's that's phenomenal. Yeah. Uh, well, you hear hunters. Uh, people go hunting and and they say I didn't get anything, but I really enjoyed the experience just to get out there and stuff. That's that's what they really cherish. Oh yeah, hunt. and and let's be honest yeah. with ourselves too. When you get out in the in the woods and you're doing your hunting for your deer, or your turkey, or whatever, even if you're not really seeing anything in the way of uh, uh, an animal to take, you got beautiful scenery around you everywhere. You got birds singing. Uh, it, it, it that alone will help relieve stress and and just make your day better. Yep. Yeah. Now I use uh, all my senses, you know, and when that's another thing. When you go out in the woods, all your senses kick in and stuff. Uh, last week, after listening to O'Neill's show, I went out in the woods and uh, looking for a lot of birds' nests. I'm photographing birds' nests this time of year. But anyhow, I smelled a, a dead animal. Oh! And I followed down into the wind through the woods. It's heavily foliated, you know, a lot of leaves and such brush, and it was about 100 yards away. I, I kicked up a buzzard off of it. 
<laughs> Actually, the buzzer was down in the in the ferns. I didn't even know he was there until he flew up. <laughs> oh and, wow! Uh, it was a, a dead porcupine. No now, kidding. Uh, not many things. Yeah, not many things kill porcupines up here, except we have fishers, which is the larger larger weasel up here. Maybe a fisher. And I think I saw that porcupine a few weeks earlier too. To tell you the truth. Hmm. Wow. But uh. Yep, so you, all your senses kick in. As a matter of fact, there's just six cents also. And, uh, you know, I got all sorts of stories about that, but uh, I won't go on with that. Um, you know, you mentioned about that, that gentleman called about an osprey, and he didn't know if it got anything or not. Um, just like Babe Ruth came to bat, or maybe even O'Neill came to bat. Every time he came to bat, he didn't hit a home run every time. But ospreys and hawks and owls, they, they don't catch everything every time they dive down. You know, it, it's... Uh, Sometimes they miss. Uh, one time a neighbor, uh, had he had a brush pile up by his house, and there laid a, a dead great horned owl. Apparently oh. it struck at something and hit into the brush pile and killed itself. Oh, wow. So, I, I, yeah, yep. Yeah, you never, just like you said, you never know what you're going to see. Your experience with the red-tailed hawk and, you know, and the, the beauty of everything like that is that's your own Whatever you see, you saw it. Nobody else has seen it. Oh yeah, like, yeah. Better yeah. than sitting in a sitting in the basement playing video games. You know, the, I used to do that a lot as a kid, and now as an adult, I realize just just what a waste of time that was. <laughs> but I yeah. will say this in I my defense: my kid was small too. But <laughs> in my defense, yeah. my old man kicked me out of the house and told me to go out and play in the woods. So I did that a lot as well. So there were, there was a little level of balance. I I owe that to my dad. Yep, there you go. <laughs> yep. uh, hey, uh, Scott, if you got a minute, just uh, we we talked about um, you called it the golden age of firearms, the 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 rifles and the bullets and all this. But then there's outdoor equipment also, which has evolved over the years. Phenomenal, Gore-Tex. Just think of Gore-Tex, <laughs> and, and then somebody putting camouflage on it. Oh you yeah, know, I remember when it first started. And, you know, the camouflage, yeah, so too, when you look at the evolution of it, you've gone from patterns to now photorealistic camo. Absolutely. Uh, you know, people don't realize what – I, I, here's a story. I sat out for over an hour by a buck scrape one time wearing wool clothes in the downpour. By the time I got back to the house, I weighed about 10 pounds more than, I, than when I went out because I was soaked with water, you know. <laughs> but had I had, you know, that was a long, long time ago. <laughs> if I had Gore Tex back then, it would have been a lot better. Oh, yeah, yeah, no question about it. You'd also probably have a little Scotch Guard on that uh, outer jacket to repel some of that water as well. Yep. <laughs> right so, uh, there's a lot of great leaps and bounds in, in uh, the outdoor field in regard to equipment. I'm sure O'Neill could talk to you for hours about fish poles and fishing equipment and all sorts of things like that. Outstanding. So, all well, right, well, enjoying the show as always. Well, thank you very much for yeah. calling, John. Have yourself a great one, and uh, we'll talk to you again, I hope. Yep, you bet. Thank you. All right. Have a great one. 404-872-0750 is the number. And we're going to go straight back to the phones. I got another Hawks story here from Brandon calling from Atlanta. Brandon, you're on 95.5 WSB Atlanta's News and Talk on O'Neill Outside. Good morning. Can you hear me? Ah, we got you, Brandon. There you are, sir. How you doing this morning? Good morning. I'm well. How are you? Ah, uh, life is good. I'm highly caffeinated and very motivated, sir. Very long-time listener. I just want to piggyback on some of the hawk stuff. Uh, I've had my property in Loganville for five years, and there's a mama hawk in the backyard at the top of a pine tree that's had five chicks in the past five years, and I've gotten a chance to watch four of them fledge. And I was watching um, the baby this morning uh, chasing squirrels. Oh, wow. Amazing. They'll sit there and scream all day long, and you'll see them stand up in their nest and, like, you know, spread their wings out and kind of get a feel for it, and then all of a sudden they'll jump off the nest and fly for the first time. It's just a very, very magical thing to witness. Oh, no question about it. And you're lucky enough to have this hawk nesting in, on your property year after year. Five years in a row. Five, five different chicks. I mean, the survival rate's amazing. Uh, and, uh, I'm assuming this is a red tail? I have a it's a red tail, yes. Wow. And I have a lot of barred out on my property as well. And one last thing, right before all the coronavirus started, I had a chance to volunteer at the Aware Animal Rescue outside of Atlanta. And uh, it was amazing. They have, uh, you know, owls and hawks and, of course, every other 
wildlife species you can imagine that are being re- rehabilitated in some form or another. And they have some uh, what they call, let's see, I think they call them uh, ambassadors, are the ones that can't be released back into the wild. Right. And there's several owls, uh, barn owls and, and red tails, as well as barred owls that will just hang out all day and just a very amazing experience getting to I actually saw that uh, something similar I was and believe it or not this was at uh, Animal Kingdom down in Disney World they had a woman um, who had an ambassador owl out there showing everybody and it, and she would let you come right up on her now you couldn't touch the animal obviously but you could get right up on right. that bird and get some perspective on how big it is and just how the the plumage is the eyes I mean everything and it was really an amazing uh, uh, thing to witness firsthand just to be able to see this this animal close up if if someone has never heard what an owl chick sounds like in the nest it's uh, it's very unique and unusual it, it kind of sounds like someone taking a really deep breath over and over again. <laughs> That's pretty cool. And my, my girl in her backyard in Roswell, she has a barred owl that has a chick in the nest, and about 3 or 4 o'clock in the morning, you'll hear it start going. It's just, I, I don't know if it'll come through on the radio or not, but it, it's like, <laughs> <laughs> it's a really strange sound. You know, it sounds like something but, that uh, uh, we need to capture on Kodak or something like that. If you can, and I'll tell you what, if you can snap a picture of that hawk or, or the uh, the fledgling or whatever, by all means, shoot it on over here to O'Neill outside. We'll throw it up on the Facebook page. I would love to. Please do. One Please last do. thing. Sure. It's fun, it's fun to get on YouTube because they have, especially with the barred owls, they're very territorial. And you can get on YouTube and just put in barred owl territorial calls and put it on like a Bluetooth speaker. And they will, if you hear one around the area, they will actually answer you. Oh, wow. Pretty cool. Pretty cool. Very cool. Well, we'll give it a shot one time. I appreciate the show. (laughs) I appreciate you calling, Brandon. Thanks for listening, and uh, give us a call again sometime. Have a good morning. All right. You as well. Well, we're going to wrap up this segment here in just a moment. You are listening to O'Neill Outside. Scott Maxim filling in for O'Neill this morning, who's taking a break for a little bit of family fun. If you'd like to give us a call and talk a little bit about your plans for the weekend, the number is 404-872-0750 or 800-972-8255 if you're outside the Atlanta calling area. Give us a ring. Welcome back to O'Neill Outside. Got the uh, short segment here to close out the top of the hour. And it looks like I'm getting inundated with hawk stories here. So let me do this before I go. I want to quickly reel off the last few of these great benefits of being outdoors before we go to the top of the hour. And then we'll pick up all the hawk stories when we have plenty of time to talk about them. Number nine, nature relieves stress, anxiety, and depression. How? Because walking in green environments reduces the stress hormone cortisol. Now, it's essential, that hormone, for good health, but elevated levels lead to anxiety, depression, memory, and concentration problems, and sleep disorders. Number, another one, number 10, being outdoors aids in recovery. Exposure to nature has been found to speed up recovery from surgery. Now, owing to the fact that I have a double hernia surgery coming up this Wednesday, I will be going outdoors afterwards and see if I can put that to the test. Ah, number 11, being in nature boosts life satisfaction. And that's true. If you feel depressed, go outside. You will feel better. Now, one study found that 20 minutes in just a park setting, mind you, uh, reported a 64% boost in life satisfaction among those that they surveyed. And that's just folks feeling good. Here's the best part. It has nothing to do with physical activity. The boost of your satisfaction levels, has all it is is just you getting outside and enjoying yourself and relaxing a little bit. Number 12, being outdoors generates creativity. As an artist, I can appreciate this. Why? Because being relaxed naturally allows our minds to wander free from the restrictions of our daily life, free from being jammed in the box. Finally, 13, your baker's dozen here, social interactivity gets boosted in the outdoors. That's right. We meet and chat with just about everybody out there. And I can tell you at Kennesaw Mountain, I talked to about a dozen people because I just dug their dogs and they were all nice people. So there you go. A bunch of reasons to get outside, all of which benefit your health. 
and you learned it here on O'Neill Outside. Come on back. We've got another hour, hour of the outdoors coming up. Scott Maximin for O'Neill. Your calls about Hawks coming up after the top of the hour. O'Neill Outside Radio is brought to you by these fine sponsors. Works, Power and Garden Tools. Toyota, let's go places. Visit your local Toyota dealers today. Big Green Egg, the most popular and most versatile ceramic grill. Huff Shed, great storage sheds and custom buildings. Year One, classic car parts for American muscle cars. Arctic Ice, the most durable, versatile, and effective cooler packs available. Timbuktu Outdoors, the ideal solution to live bait. Furminator, the best food plot implement on earth. And the Georgia Department of Natural Resources and State Parks. From Black Powder Headquarters and the Bojangled Studio at Three Falls Cabin in the North Georgia Mountains, it's time for O'Neill Outside. For anything in the outdoors, this is your source. Listen in and call the show with your comments or questions. And now, here's O'Neill. O'Neill isn't here, but from Three Falls Cabin in the North Georgia Mountains and the Bojangle Studio, welcome to a brand new unused substitute Scott Maxim host Saturday morning here on O'Neill Outside. This is Works Radio brought to you by Works Tools, Stripling's General Store, Tough Shed, Snellville Heating... Snowville Heating and Air, Rocco's Pub, Georgia Department of Natural Resources and State Parks and Historic Sites, the Big Green Egg Smokers and Grills, True Turn Hooks and Roadrunner Lures, Arctic Ice Freezer Packs, O'Neill's Podcast, Fisher's Choice Baits, General Spring, and Ritta Critter. So there you go. Great products all. Check them out because they're the guys that bring you this excellent program. You're listening to O'Neill Outside. We're in our second hour of outdoor talk today and I'm going to take a really quick call. Let's see, can I fit one in here? Yeah, I think I can. Let's talk to Alan up and coming. He's got a hawk story for us here on O'Neill outside. Can you get it to us real quick there, Alan? Yes, sir. Lay it on me. you uh, background. Can you hear me? Yeah, absolutely. Go, my friend. Okay. Uh, I was blessed with a dad that raised me honey fishing, and being outside. I was also blessed with a uncle who every year prepared a dove field. And until I was hearing some of the stories you were telling, um, I didn't think anybody believed me. <laughs> me and my cousin were standing there, and I had my limit. He lacked one. And a long dove come across the field. And he shot it. The dove folded up, dropped about two feet, and a hawk grabbed it and flew off with it. Hold that thought, my friend. We've got a thief hawk, and we're going to talk about that here again in a second. You're listening to O'Neill Outside on W. Uh, I'm sorry, 95.5 WSB Atlanta's News and Talk. And welcome to 1340 WSBM in Florence, Alabama. We'll be back in just a couple. Don't go anywhere. Welcome back to O'Neill Outside. Glad to have you here this morning. Scott Maxim filling in for O'Neill. And we're going to go straight back to the phones here as we start this hour and continue with Alan. He's calling about a hawk that he saw while he was out uh, in a field one day. So sorry to cut you off there, Alan. We had to take care of a little business. But if you could pick up right where you left off, sir. Not a problem. Um, basically, I have an uncle that always prepares a dove field. And we typically have around 100 to 200 hunters around the field to keep the doves flying. And it was the end of the day, and my cousin had not got his limit yet. And a lone dove flew across the field. He pulled up, shot the dove. The dove folded up, was falling to the ground, and a hawk grabbed it out of midair. Are you straight out of the air? You do all the work, and the hawk has the meal? Evidently, <laughs> my cousin had two more shots in his gun, and I won't go there. <laughs> not, yeah, let's not he do got that. He the dove eventually. <laughs> no question about that. But, yeah, they're, they're extremely opportunistic. I mean, these, these animals, uh, if they see a meal, man, they're going to jump. They don't have a problem with it. Well, here's another strange thing. 
Imagine a hundred, around a hundred people shooting shotguns at doves, and at the back of the field, you see five deer walk across, totally ignoring the hunters within thirty yards of them. That's and they hilarious. Were just kind of walking along. Well, you know, they knew they were out of season, so they weren't too worried. Well, yeah, they got a calendar better than mine. <laughs> yeah. Photoperiodism. Yeah, we know that here on O'Neill. So, but I had never been able to tell a story that I thought people would actually believe, and it actually happened. And hearing the other stories, I thought I'd call in this year. And thank you for it. We really appreciate it. And, you know, actually, when you think about it, this is a rare thing to see is is a bird just pluck that meal straight out of the air like that on the wing. That That's truly a, a, a – I don't think you'll ever see anything like that again in your life probably. Um, Probably not. No. Nah. I mean, I was utterly amazed that I saw it then. Yeah. Beautiful animals, but man. But this was before iPhones and cameras, so I couldn't take a picture or anything. Ah, uh, you know what? But you got one in the memory, and that's all that counts right now, huh? It is. All right. It is a memory I will die with <laughs> and still smile every time I think about it. And how could you not? Alan, got a bail, but thanks for the call. Here we got Captain Max standing by. He wants to tell us what's up with Lanier. Thank you, Scott. All right. Have yourself a great day, and give us a call again. We appreciate you. Bye-bye. All righty. All right, with no further adieu, let's get Captain Mac in here, and boom, you should be there, my friend. What's going go. on, Mac? Good good morning, Brother Scott. How are you? I am doing very well this morning. Thank you very much, sir. I got my second win here, and I am feeling very motivated. Awesome, awesome. You sounded. I'm, I'm energized just listening to you. You got me waking ready to roll now. So that's right on. Good. That's very good. Well, I'm assuming and that you're fixing to roll out to the lake. Everybody needs to roll out to the lake. Fishing's good. The lakes fish well really all spring, but uh, it's been good lately. We're in typical summer patterns with the stripers. They're getting into deep water, and you can start to bunch up real nice. We're seeing some good catches in terms of numbers and size. So it's a good downline with bluebacks are probably your your uh, overall best pattern, but there's also a really good trolling bite, lead core with chipmunk jigs or mini max. That's been real strong. Nice. Uh, yeah, fish are mostly on the lower end. There's still a lot of fish in the middle part of the lakes. There's still plenty of opportunities. Fish your favorite place and uh, just get out there and keep moving. They're deep enough you're going to see them with the sonar, so move. If you're not seeing fish, keep moving until you see them. Once you, if you can locate them, they're biting pretty well. So it's all in all a really good report. Uh, I think, too, the rain holds off today, so it looks like we got a pretty nice weather day. I, I, I haven't been as diligent about the weather as I should be, but it's, I, if I remember right, the rain chance is like a 30% chance today. Well, you know, that's what we have fish. Kurt Mellish for here, my friend. Exactly. I listen to him on the way in in the morning, and I don't have to worry. That's it. his, it's his gig. I should worry about the fish. Well, so, now, yeah, he keeps, he keeps us up to speed on that. Now, along those lines, I do have a question for you. It's not necessarily about the fish themselves, but I have noticed uh, uh, a few stories here and there about a lot more people getting out to the lakes, outdoors and everything like that because of these lockdowns. It's one of the last places you can go in a lot of these states. Mm -hmm. Have you been seeing a lot more pressure from the fishermen on the lakes? Oh, no doubt. I, it's, uh, is, I don't want to say this or I don't want to sound insensitive because I, I understand that COVID is real and it's very serious. Mm-hmm. And it's caused a lot of adverse effects, so I, I don't want to just disregard that. But it has energized the fishing industry because of what you just said. Your recreational opportunities have been lessened severely this year. Yeah. And the lake is, is still a good opportunity. So we've seen a huge uptick in the number of fishermen. Uh, recreational traffic as well. The lake's been very heavily used. Not just this lake. Uh, I was down at the coast when snapper season opened. It's un unbelievable how many people were down there. So people are taking advantage of these opportunities because that's what they've got. And one of the good things, I've talked to a lot of people in the fishing industry and what the hope is, a lot of kids that normally would be really wrapped up with playing some type of sports and they were unable to do that, have spent a lot more time on the lake. So hopefully we've got a couple of younger generations here that we've introduced to and energized to fishing. And that would be great in the outdoors in general. It's not just, you know, you got folks camping and hiking and that kind of stuff. So all that's good. We're getting some kids out, and hopefully we'll show them that, and they'll uh, 
get an appreciation for it that they'll retain as they grow older and into adulthood. So, uh, and that yes, that would definitely uptick. be the silver lining there to this whole uh, this whole pandemic uh, nightmare. Yeah, no question. Because uh, this is, like I said, we know it's real and it's probably not going to go away anytime soon. But uh, on that note, take advantage of it and enjoy the lake and and people have and it's, it's good to see. So outstanding. Yeah, you're right, but there. Yeah, hopefully that's the one one of the positives that comes out of this, maybe. And well, Mac, if people want to get in touch with you for a day on the lake, what do they need to do and where do they need to go? They can call us at 770-271-0851 or they can find us online at Captain Mac, C-A-P-T-M-A-C-K-S. We're there 24-7. Outstanding. Good to hear from you, my friend, and have a great day out on the lake. All right, you too, buddy. Take care. Good talking with you. And everybody get out there, catch fish, be safe, enjoy the outdoors. Outstanding. All right, appreciate you, Mac. Let's go back to the phones here. I got another hawk story. Whoa, or do I? No, apparently not. Uh, let's lose that one. Let's go back to the lines here. Ross in Villa Rica has a gun question for us here today. Uh, Ross, how are you doing this morning? You're on O'Neill outside. Hey, good morning, Scott. Good morning. I, uh, I was talking to my dad, and he says you're a gun guru. So I was, uh, I want to join the masses and uh, get me a 6.5 Creedmoor. Uh, I was just wondering, uh, what if, is there a certain brand, or you know, I've been looking at the Bagaras and stuff like that. But what do you recommend for? Well, the, I would say this: um, I'm pretty sure uh, our sponsor here, CVA, has a uh, um, their rifle ready to go in that chambering. If they don't, then they will soon. Um, that Bergara Barra is going to be the best thing you got going. Plus, CVA also has on their bolt actions a money back guarantee on the rifle. So, if you don't like it, you can return it for a full refund. I don't think too many people are out there doing that. So, yeah, I would definitely look at them, but you can't go wrong with your standard manufacturers. Um, you can look at Ruger, for example, Remington, uh, uh, Smith and Wesson's got a few bolts out there that might come in handy for you. But um, yeah, uh, Thompson Center. Is, uh, is Smith & Wesson. There's a lot of good, solid brands out there that will chamber that round, and it's an exceptionally popular round right now as well. Yeah, I had a friend tell me that they're moving so fast that he shot a deer with it, and the only negative thing I've heard was he shot a deer with it, uh, and it just ripped through it so fast. He said it didn't leave much of a blood trail or a very small hole now. Uh, that's hard to believe, and that's the bullet. I'm sure that's you know, yeah. It does to... it does travel a little faster and a little flatter than a 308, I believe. Um, it's it's definitely a, a a longer, flatter shot than that. Um, so I could see that being a problem. Yeah, but uh, if that's your smallest complaint against it, I that's a small complaint. Yes. But yeah, I think anything with a hole all the way through it in the right place. It's a not great round, my friend. You can't go wrong. And again, any of the major manufacturers, you'll be just fine. I got to bail, my friend. Time to take Thank care you. of a little business. You're listening to O'Neill Outside on 95.5 WSB and Coast to Coast on SB Nation. Welcome back to O'Neill Outside. Hour two of the Outdoor Talk. Brought to you by yours truly here this morning, Scott Maxim, filling in for O'Neill. We're live on 95.5 FM WSB, Atlanta's News and Talk. We have a new station in the family. Very happy to welcome 1340 WSBM in Florence, Alabama. They got us covered just to the west. Up north, WEEI in Boston. They've got us going loud and proud up there for all the people up in New England and out in Dallas, that's right, Big D's got the ticket, plus there are dozens more stations coast-to-coast coast on SB Nation Radio. Thank you so much for joining us this morning, and I want to uh, take this moment. The Hawk calls have, have stopped, so I'm going to take the opportunity to jump into uh, my topic here for the second hour, and that would be uh, dealing with the first-time gun purchase. Now, there's a lot of folks out there right now and a lot of unrest going on with lockdowns with riots with property damage and it's causing a lot of anxiety and angst among a lot of people because quite honestly the police in many cases aren't able to respond so we have to start making some choices here and and a gun has become a big deal for a lot of people right now um if you look at first-time gun buyers it is at a level that hasn't been seen probably in about five or six years, if not more. People are genuinely afraid of 
not being able to protect themselves and their family. So today I'm going to give us a few options to consider when we're considering defensive firearms. But here's the catch. They also have some sporting applications. So in addition to being a defensive weapon for the home, we could take it outside hunting or perhaps some shooting competitions. And before I get into this, I want the folks who are, who are considering the gun purchase to consider this. And here's something that O'Neill reads every now and again on the program, and many of you all have heard this before. It's called Why I Carry a Gun and Know How to Use It. If you'll indulge me here. I don't carry a gun to kill people. I carry a gun to keep from being killed. I don't carry a gun to scare people. I carry a gun because sometimes this world can be a scary place. I don't carry a gun because I'm paranoid. I carry a gun because there are real threats in the world. I don't carry a gun because I'm evil. I carry a gun because I have lived long enough to see the evil in the world and the necessity to protect myself and my loved ones from it. I don't carry a gun because I hate the government. I carry a gun because I understand the constitutional limitations of government. I don't carry a gun because I'm angry. I carry a gun th so that I don't have to spend the rest of my life hating myself for failing to be prepared to protect my family and property. I don't carry a gun because I want to shoot someone. I carry a gun because I want to die at a ripe old age in my bed and not on a sidewalk somewhere tomorrow afternoon. I don't carry a gun just because I'm constitutionally guaranteed this right. I carry a gun because history has proven, uh, proven it to be the final defense against a tyrannical, oppressive, police state type of government. I don't carry a gun to make me feel like a superior person. I carry a gun because only those prepared know how to take care of themselves and the ones they love. I don't carry a gun because I feel inadequate. I carry a gun because being unarmed and facing three armed thugs, I'm inadequate and probably would get killed. I don't carry a gun because I love it. I carry a gun because I love life and the people who make it meaningful to me. Police cannot be everywhere to protect us at all times. Often, they must investigate the crime after it happens. Free citizens must protect themselves. I carry a gun because I'm too young to die, too old to take a beating, and too old to give up my liberty and freedom. This is not the mentality of what a lot of people who are opposed to gun ownership would have you believe is the mentality of the typical firearms owner. But I can assure you that people who respect these weapons, people who train with these weapons, people who want to be good with these weapons, respect them immensely for what they can do and their potential. 404-872-0750 uh, is the number. Give me a call if you have any questions. Today, I'm going to take a look at some defensive firearms tips for you and five options that are great ones. For, for defense and five not so great ones. So let's get right into it and start off with some of your best options for home defense. Let's start off with the shotgun. Everybody knows it. Everybody loves it. The shotgun, preferably a pump action for one reason. Rack that gun and if anybody's hanging around and crazy enough knowing what that sound is, that's on them. That is completely on them. These guns... In a 12-gauge or 20-gauge are devastating at close range when using buckshot or a slug. So any invaders, any problems, this will take care of the issue quite quickly. Uh, the relatively inexpensive to purchase and relatively inexpensive to buy ammo for them. Uh, you can train with birdshot, for example, going out to the skeet and trap range. You can learn how to track your targets. You can learn how to track targets going away from you as, as, as well as across you. There's a lot of things you can do with that shotgun. And though, for example, a pump-action shotgun may not be optimized for skeet or trap, you can at least get in there and see how it works and learn how to use that particular shotgun to hit those clays. Um, you can look, for example, if you have multiple shooters in the house, multiple people that need to uh, take this weapon up. If, for example, you have a woman of slight frame, perhaps a 20-gauge option is preferable to a 12. It still delivers about 70% of the power, but in a considerably lighter and easier package to use. Now, your sporting applications, as I mentioned, you can do some deer hunting with it, some bird hunting, do a little skeet and trap shooting, and some sporting clays as well. 
Uh, typically, if you're looking for the Home D options, Mossberg or Remington are the ones that most people will gravitate to. And in the case of Mossberg, I would say they have one slight advantage in that the safety is located up on the tang of the gun, meaning where the back of the receiver meets the stock. The safety is there, and that allows for easy use by ambidextrous people. Or I'm sorry, by left-handers and right-handers. So you have ambidextrous safety on that particular firearm, and it's really awesome. Now, another option for home defense is the kel KSG. It's a bullpup shotgun. There's a few of them out there, but the kel just comes to mind. Essentially, the shotgun is about this big. They've shrunk the shotgun down from what would typically be about, eh, about a 36-inch package or so, including barrel and stock and all that stuff. They shrunk it down to about in the mid-20s total. And they do that by moving the barrel into the stock. So it's a very small package, very easily maneuver indoors. And again, 12-gauge available, devastating round. The next one I would recommend people look at, the full-sized 9mm pistol. And what do I mean by full-sized? I don't mean a compact carry pistol. I'm talking about typically one that has a four inch barrel and is not easily stowed away say concealed carry these these are a little larger and the reason why you want these is because in nine millimeter the ammo even though there's a shortage right now tends to be more plentiful than other types of ammo it's also cheaper than other types of ammo allowing for more time to practice uh the nine millimeter is a very easy to shoot round and among automatics, the semi-auto uh, pistols, they also tend to have the most capacity in storage for their magazines. Typically, 15 to 18 rounds in a mag with one in the pipe, and you're good to go. Um, would I recommend going with a 40 or a 45? It's not that much difference. I only say that the 9 is better, 1 for capacity, 2 for ease of shooting, and 3 for the cheapness of the ammo relative to the other two. So... Take a look at the full size. Typically, your brands would be Glock, Smith & Wesson, Springfield, uh, uh, Springfield Armory, uh, Rock Island Armory. There's all kinds of them that make 9mm pistols. Stick with a brand that works, that has a great reputation, great customer service, and most of all, make sure the gun fits your hand because not all guns will fit your hand the same. I know for a fact... I have a hard time gripping Sig Sauer's because I have stubby thumbs and I can't operate them. Their controls are too long. Same with a 1911. Get out to a gun show, grip as many as you can, and see what fits in your hand. Now, are there sporting applications for the 9mm? Absolutely, but not for hunting. Not terribly good semi-autos for hunting. What you have instead are events like action shooting, where you measure speed against targets, hitting one or more targets, uh, silhouette, again, another one that you shoot at a silhouette. Uh, I'm sorry, it's, it's kind of a country fair thing. Um, there's all kinds of targets and some may be moving and so on, but you basically shoot your ducks and so on. Um, precision is, is really tough. This one, you have to shoot one-handed at your target at distance of 10 to 50 meters, which is an excellent way of learning trigger control and one-handed operation. And finally, IDPA, the International Defensive Pistol Association, they set up competitions that reflect real-life scenarios. So, for example, I went to one um, a few years ago where they had all these different outdoor pits, these, these areas set up with berms, and every one of them had a different scenario. So, for example, in one of them, you're supposed to come out of a bookstore, and you actually are holding books under one arm, and as you enter this area, you're, these targets jump out, and you have to figure out who the bad guy is, for lack of a better term, and react accordingly. Other situations included shooting out of car windows, the restaurant attack where you're sitting at a table at like a, a fast food restaurant and then somebody comes in, moving targets as you're seated. It's really in-depth and a really great way of learning how to use that 9mm effectively. Uh, another great recommendation here for home defense, the AR-15. A lot of people don't like the AR-15. It's the big bad gun. Oh, no. It's the bad old black gun that's going to hurt you just by looking at it. Well, it's not going to hurt you by looking at it. But as we can attest to a recent incident here in California, a liquor store owner in the middle of a riot zone stood out in front of his liquor store with a bunch of his friends all armed, some with ARs, some with other weapons. But the ARs 
were prominent out in front, and all the people that were looking to do some damage bypassed not only his store, but the stores around him. So is it a deterrent? Absolutely. Another great advantage, very easy to shoot. A very easy to shoot gun. It can be used by just about everybody in your house, including children on occasion. I've even seen stories where a young boy saved his sister from a home invasion because of that. I tell you what, got to bail for a couple minutes. We'll be back in a minute. You're listening to O'Neill Outside on WSB. Guns, guns, guns today. If you're thinking about purchasing your first firearm, give me a call. 404-872-0750 is the number in the Atlanta calling area. 800-972-8255 for all of you coast to coast on SB Nation Radio. And to our new friends out in Florence, Alabama at 1340 WSBM. And i got to say, I like that because those are my initials. Scott Bryce Maxim, that's me. All right, getting back to the guns that we recommend. Quick review, the shotgun, 12 or 20 gauge, pump preferable, the full-sized 9mm duty pistol, and the AR-15. Now, again, AR-15, big bad gun, but why is it one of the best for home defense? Well, it's incredibly reliable. You can, uh, you can run these guns all day long, and they just keep on clicking. One thing that makes this gun incredibly interesting is that it's incredibly modular. You can build this thing out any way you want to. You can add rails to it, scopes to it, lights to it. You could put four grips on it. You could put pistol grips on it, whatever you want. You can make this gun your own and in doing so, learn about the ins and outs of its operations. Now, there are some sporting applications for this gun and keep in mind too, it's chambered across a wide variety of ammo wide variety nine millimeter for example you could put in there and double up with your pistol on ammo you can put 308 in there 223 the myriad options so your sporting applications are going to be dictated of course by your ammo for example if you get an ar in 223 might be pretty good for doing some varminting but i wouldn't go up against a hog with it or and i certainly don't think i would try to take a deer with it either but that being said, now you can get that thing chambered in a 308, even 7.62x39 Russian, which is a great gun, great gun to go out and take care of the hogs with. So the AR-15 slash AR-10, highly, highly recommended. And again, you can't really go wrong across the board. There's a lot of very good reputable manufacturers, and you can start off with a very entry-level rifle and just build off of it as you go down the road so a very good option another one the full-size 357 revolver now why the 357 one very common round two very good and powerful round three it can be used in other guns rifles i've seen them for pump actions chambered in 357 so you have some versatility but also the 357 will also shoot the slightly less powerful 38 special ammo meaning that you can practice with the 38 special and then chamber the 357 when you want to take it out now as far as sporting applications these uh, revolvers are outstanding as trail guns no question about it but you're going to want to match caliber to what you may expect again hogs with a 357 you might be on the low end of being able to take care of those if you've got one charging you you're probably going to want to look at something a little higher up in caliber. Maybe something starting with a dot four would be the way to go. Uh, you want to look at a four-inch barrel and not a snubby. And the reason why is because as you're aiming the revolver, that extra length will help you with the sight picture. Typically, snubbies, really short sight picture, really short, uh, inaccurate sights. The longer sight is the way to go. Secondly, with that longer barrel recoil is reduced due to the mass of the gun now as far as particular companies uh there's ruger smith and wesson they both make some good ones taurus as well get out there grip them talk with some guys at some gun shows see what they have to say and finally we have one more revolver the taurus and smith and wesson 410 revolvers now these revolvers will shoot either a 410 shot shell or a 45 long Colt bullet. So you can get specifically 
anti-personnel shot shells in the 410. And while not powerful, they do put a hit on you, but you can alternate in the cylinders with that 45 long colt if you feel the need. So, again, very versatile, great for home defense. Sporting applications, throw it out. Not really that good. Again, might be good for a trail gun if you use the 45 long colt, but as far as the sporting application, not much there. Excuse me a moment. <coughs> oh, goodness gracious. So, that being said, five good recommendations for home defense, but what do you kind of want to avoid? Well, here are some of the worst choices that you can make for firearms and why. Now, first of all, remember we were talking about getting a full-sized 9. Well, one of the worst options are the pocket guns. And these are small guns that, by name, fit in your pocket. They're tiny, usually chambered in something like a 22 long range or a 25 auto, something without a lot of power. They're not meant to be anything more than a last-ditch uh, close combat weapon. Um, the short barrel makes sight pictures tough to acquire. Uh, they're just, they're not very practical as a main defensive weapon. If you've got it, okay, but you're going to want to trade up. Another one, getting back to revolvers. Now, we, we were talking about that 357, and that's great, but what you want to try to avoid are the quote unquote large revolvers. These are the cal ones that are chambered in calibers like 44 Magnum, 460 Smith & Wesson, 500 Smith & Wesson. These are, generally speaking, just far too powerful for home defense. you got to worry about over-penetration through walls. With every gun you shoot in a home defense situation, meaning that the bullet you throw may go through a wall and hurt somebody on the other side. So you always have to keep that in mind. But with the large revolvers, these rounds will go through walls easily. And... They're just too powerful and too unwieldy for a home defense situation. Now, what are they good for? If you go to Alaska, they're great for chasing off bears and moose. That's about all I can come up with. They are really cool for that, and they're really cool to, to throw some lead down range on a whim. But for home defense, not terribly practical. Okay, another one. Getting back to shotties here. Single shot shotguns single shot rifles um if you only have one shot you better not miss you know o'neill's always talking about taking the muzzle loader challenge the one shot challenge well if you're looking at a first time firearm purchase you kind of don't want to go that route that's something for a more experienced shooter and for a home defense it's just not something worth having at all one round and that's it and then you gotta pop it and reload terribly impractical um they're great if you want to go out and you know, shoot some some targets, some birds, skeet or trap or whatever. That's fine, but again, for home D, the single shot rifle or shotgun is just not terribly practical. Another one here: bolt action rifle. Now, bolt actions are great for hunting. There's no question about it. If you got bolt actions, you're good to go for just about anything out there in the woods, right? Not the case so much for home D. Again, the rifle round tends to be too powerful. The over-penetration tends to be an option. But that being said as well, the capacities of rifles, of bolt-action rifles and their magazines, typically five rounds. It's not bad. But when you talk about popping it, reloading it, racking it, and it's just too much of a hassle. It's, it's not fast enough compared to something like a semi-auto, like an AR. So for that reason, the bolt-action doesn't make much sense. Now, getting out in the woods makes a ton of sense that's your that's your main go-to when you're talking about putting food on the table with deer or hogs or whatever you want that is the platform of choice no question about it home d not so much last one here that i have is a poor choice or what i refer to as mill serp rifles simply put military surplus rifles now i've talked with a lot of guys at gun shows who use military surplus rifles as a backup for their primary in case something goes wrong with it or it's in repair. I've talked with some guys who've bought them just as something fun to shoot, some historical value to it. But for the purposes of home defense, they're not terribly practical because, one, you get all the problems of the typical bolt action, so loading and reloading rounds is slow and cumbersome. Two, again, the rounds are insanely powerful so 
for example, I have a Mosin Nagant at home. I wouldn't pull that thing out and shoot it because it shoots what's known as the 357, I'm sorry, 762 by 54 Russian round. And that's more powerful than a 308. Not a good option for the home. Um, typically, these Milserp weapons are from World War II vintage times. So they're not as technologically advanced. What does that mean? It means you're going to get materials that are going to be heavier. Uh, the stocks are going to be extremely bulky compared to modern polymer stocks or modern wood stocks or laminate stocks. Um, and in addition, they don't typically have very good safety features. My Mosin, for example, doesn't have a simple flip safety that you can hit with your thumb. What it has is the bolt has a knob on the end of it that you have to physically pull out and rotate left before it goes into safe. Again, not a great thing to have to pull off of safe if you're in a situation at home with a home invader or some other problem. It's just, it just doesn't, it's not the ultimate optimum use. Um, and in addition, it, sometimes finding ammo for these guns is a little weird. If you have a, for example, a Mauser chambered in some weird five point something caliber or a Japanese World War II rifle, finding ammo is going to be a problem. Um, if you've got a, a 308, for example, rifle, bah, easy peasy. Find it everywhere you're looking. So, again, it's not a, a great option for the home, but fun for shooting and sometimes not a bad option for getting out in the field. So, if you want to consider anything for home defense, please consider some of these options that I've thrown out at you here today um, as far as options to look at. Don't be afraid. There are plenty of people in the gun stores and at the gun shows who are more than happy to talk to you, explain stuff to you, tell you about your local laws. And I would even say this, if you are considering buying a, a handgun for defense of property or yourself, the first thing you need to do is go online and look up an author. This guy's name is Masad Ayub. And really all you need to do is remember his last name, A-Y-O-O-B. This gentleman is one of the preeminent gun writers in America. His videos are all over YouTube. And his specialty is the after-shooting legal ramifications. So whatever happens in a shooting situation, he's got a bunch of scenarios laid out that shows what happened not only to the, you know, the, the shooter, but also sometimes the shootee, the person who was the invader or whatever. There's, there's some really weird scenarios where the law comes into play that seem counterintuitive, and he will discuss. So Masad Ayub, A-Y-O-O-B, look up everything this man has written about firearms to, before you, you think about purchasing one for yourself. It's a great window to show you exactly uh, what you need to be aware of if you're going to go out and buy your firearm. And finally, I would say this. I got some tips for you with regard to the five rules of gun safety. This is what you need to know. Number one, golden rule. Treat all guns as if they're loaded. Until you pick it up, clear that chamber, and check it for yourself, every gun you see is loaded. Two, never point the gun at anything you are not willing to destroy. Note the word destroy. Not hurt, not stop. You need to be having the mindset that if something is coming at you or somebody is coming at you, that trigger, when you pull it, you're there to put them down. Number three, keep your finger off that trigger until you have made the decision to shoot. That's very important because you never know if you might flinch. You don't want to throw a bullet down, down range because you can never call that bullet back. Four, always be sure of your target and what's behind it. Getting back to the overpenetration, walls, and so on. And finally, always secure your guns from unauthorized persons. You're listening to O'Neill Outside. We'll be back in just a moment with the Medal of Honor uh, recipient of the week. Honor, courage, and strength of character. These qualities are embodied by the recipients of the Medal of Honor. Now let's recognize this week's Medal of Honor recipient on O'Neill Outside. Germany, 18 March, 1945. Corporal Edward J. Wilkin... The Medal of Honor recipient. He spearheaded his unit's assault of the Siegfried Line. Heavy fire from enemy riflemen and camouflaged pillboxes had pinned down his comrades when he moved forward on his own initiative to 
reconnoiter a route of advance. He cleared the way into an area studded with pillboxes where he repeatedly stood up and walked into vicious enemy fire, storming one fortification after another with automatic rifle fire and grenades, killing enemy troops, taking prisoner as the enemy defense became confused, and encouraging his comrades, comrades by his heroic example. He engaged in fierce firefights, standing in open while his adversaries fought from the protection of concrete emplacements, and on one occasion, pursued enemy soldiers across an open field and through interlocking trenches, disregarding the crossfire from two pillboxes until he had penetrated the formidable line 200 yards in advance of any American element. That night, though terribly fatigued, he refused to rest and insisted on distributing rations and supplies to his comrades. Hearing that a nearby company was suffering heavy casualties, he secured permission to guide litter bearers and assist them in evacuating the wounded. All that night, he remained in the battle area on his mercy missions, and for the following two days, he continued to remove casualties, venturing into enemy-held territory, scorning cover, and braving devastating mortar and artillery bombardments. In three days, he neutralized and captured six pillboxes single-handedly, killed at least nine Germans, wounded 13, took 13 prisoners, aided in the capture of 14 others, and saved many American lives by his fearless performance as a litter bearer. Through his superb fighting skill, dauntless courage, and gallant, inspiring actions, Corporal, Corporal Wilkin contributed in large measure to his company's success in cracking the Siegfried line. That about do it for O'Neill Outside this week. Thanks for joining us. We'll see you next time here on 95.5 WSB Atlanta's News and Talk and Coast to Coast on SB Nation Radio. See you next time. I once asked a mighty hunter a coming home from the field how he came to possess such mighty hunting and fishing skill. He said, I'll tell you a secret, son. I learned everything I know from listening to O'Neill outside on my radio.